the better understanding of what Marshall McLuhan was talking about. So it's important to know that we're, we're working on this together. These are not easy concepts to grasp. Um, and we work through them together and that makes it easier. So use this session as a way of um, helping you to understand some of these concepts. So just to get, get started, firstly, who has ever heard of Marshall McLuhan before this class? Have any of you? And from previous experience, I suspect that the lack of response is because you hadn't heard of him. Good. So the nose have it indeed. Um, Marshall McLuhan, who, when I was in college about a million years ago, was uh, the epitome of leading edge uh, and cutting edge um, philosophy, particularly uh, social science and, and the understanding of our world around us. So therefore, um, would it be equally fair to assume that none of you had heard of the phrase, the medium is the message before? One other a uh, phrase that is very much associated with Marshall McLuhan, as he coined it, is the global village. Have any of you heard of that phrase? Yes. Oh, fantastic. Okay. So you, Johanna, had heard of it. A few of you had heard of the idea of the global village. And in what context had you heard of it? Was it just a phrase that you had sort of come across? You'd heard people refer to it? Did you understand what it was meant, what was meant by it, or did you just assume? Because it seems like something fairly easy to understand on the face of it. I just made an assumption. Like I, I recognized yeah. the phrase. You reckon it was familiar. In other words, it was something yeah. you'd heard of before. Yeah, but you weren't quite sure where you'd heard of it. And, and it's not. Exactly. Let's face it. It's not such a strange phrase that. If you heard it, you'd be wondering what the origin is. You'd, you'd think it was just something that was in common currency all the time. Okay, so they're the two most famous phrases that are associated with Marshall McLuhan. I'm going to start and talk a little bit about the medium as the message. And let's see if we can unpack that phrase and see what was actually meant by it. I'm going to ask you guys to throw out some suggestions. So what, what do you think... Marshall McLuhan meant when he said the medium is the message. Um, is it like um, the way you present a thought or something like that is how it good. should be, is how it is oh. perceived? Very good. That's a good start. So the way you present a thought. And by saying that, what you're suggesting um, is that there's a difference between the thought itself and the way we might present our thoughts. Isn't that right? Yeah. Yeah. Anybody agree with that? Or would you like to add to that? Do you think that's what Marshall McLuhan meant? So, Johanna was saying that the medium is the message, um, is a way of expressing that there is a separation between an idea or a thought that we might have and the manner in which we express it. Does that make sense to you? Would you, would anybody like to give an example of that advertisement? Would you like to explain that a little bit, Johanna? Um, like in advertising, it's a lot, it's, heavy set on visuals and the way you word things to not maybe manipulate your audience or just to yeah. make whatever you are trying to sell um likable and what you want oh. to buy very good and if we were to separate the message from the medium in an ad what the message is clearly the the product that the advertiser is trying to sell. What is the medium? Or what might the medium be? Because there could be different media, couldn't there? Like uh, video or like posters. Exactly. Word of mouth, maybe? Precise speech. So the media is the, the tool that communicates the idea. And uh, that could be, as you said, it could be the print medium. 
It could be the video medium. It could be speech. It could be us talking. What other examples are there of different forms of media that you might be aware of? Social media, the internet. Social media, the internet. Okay, I come over here. Books. What part, what form of media uh, would books come under, do you think? Society. If we were to group them together with, um, say, magazines, newspapers, it's effectively part of what we call the print media, isn't it? The medium is print. Press, exactly. Is television a form of media? Society, very good by Goblin. Actually, you're, that's very advanced. Um, you're We'll be coming to that in a moment and, and seeing why that's an advanced uh, answer. It's a good answer. Television or radio or the print media or the medium of speech or the internet. What does it mean when McLuhan says the message is not as important as the medium? What on earth could that possibly mean? When you try and um, communicate with another individual, another human being, another person, and let's say you make a phone call to them. So the medium is the, the telephone. Um, and probably most of you text rather than speak on the telephone these days. So let's say you text a friend that uh, you can't meet them as you had planned to. How could the medium, do you think, be more important than the message in that case? Or can it be, or is it? I suppose without the medium, there is no message. Okay, that's a good, that's a good answer. So without the medium, there cannot even be a message. I suppose it also, that's one way. yeah, like there's, there's context associated with the, the medium of delivery, like you wouldn't, I don't, I don't know, like if you're watching you're, something on TV, it probably holds more authority. That's a really, that's a good point now. That's a very, very strong point. Um, the the medium itself influences the message and how you might perceive it isn't that right so for instance <clears throat> if you get your news about an event that has happened maybe a, a, a hugely important world event you might trust it more from a trusted television news program than perhaps a post on whatsapp or Facebook. So that's one way in which the medium can be more important than the message itself. Can any of you remember um, from the interview with McLuhan um, what he actually said when he was asked, how is the medium more important than the message? So what, what McLuhan said <clears throat> is that in many cases the message affects only a few people but the medium affects many and that really goes back to what Bad Goblin said earlier about society. So Bad Goblin uh, mentioned society a moment ago. So why do you think I've come back to that point?
what has the medium got to do with society, do you think? Any guesses? Just throw out any answer that pops into your mind, even if it's a single word. So how many people it reaches? Very important. Bad God. Society is important in the world. Exactly. Anything else? Society is easily influenced. Exactly. What, uh, we'll come back to that and discuss that in a bit more detail. Accessible to many people with groups. Exactly. Okay, I think, I think you have the hang of it. McLuhan also spoke about um, the different types of society that we've inhabited and how uh, media affected those many people who trust the word of the community. So exactly, the word of a community is perhaps carries more weight than the word of an individual. Um, in, in talking about societies, McLuhan referred to oral culture. What do you understand by the term oral culture? Anybody want to hazard a guess? So when I when we refer to the oral culture, what do we mean? Who are we talking about or what are we talking about? Again, just just guess. There's no, you know, don't worry about being wrong or right in this. Just throw out some immediate responses that pop into your head. Okay, said rather than written. Okay. Exactly. So the oral culture, it's word of mouth. It's a spoken culture, isn't that right? Words that we cannot understand are understood by certain people. Yes, that's a sophisticated example indeed. Um, bad goblin, it is correct. A discussion. So what we mean when we refer to oral culture in this context is the culture that um, existed in the world before the written word. And it is interesting, isn't it, that we call that an oral culture. So we refer to it as a spoken culture. But what organ do you think we use most frequently? What organ in our body is the most important organ for an oral culture to exist in? The hand, not really the hand, no, although it, it could, it's not wrong. The mouth is not what I'm thinking of either, but again, it's not wrong. The ear, somebody said ears, and that's what Marshall McLuhan said. He said the oral culture is recognized by uh, the fact that the ear is the most important organ. The brain, of course, is, is critical. The eyes are relevant, but really, what we're saying is that the ear is the is what how you recognize oral culture. Then printing was invented. Well, before that, writing was invented, but it was really only when printing became ubiquitous that our society changed into a, a, a visual culture, a reading culture. And what organ do you think was most important there? The eyes, exactly. So again, hands would be correct because people who are blind can read using their hands. They, they use braille. Um, but the eye is the dominant organ. So there's an example of a medium which changed the organ uh, that we as human beings use most uh, importantly and most frequently in how we understand the society in which we live. Do you think at the time when printing was being invented uh, that people understood the impact it was going to have on society? 
do you have any examples maybe of what changes what changes came about in our human society as a result of printing becoming the dominant form of communication and the dominant medium for sending messages to each other whole religions were accessible exactly if you want to unpack that a little bit it meant that religion during um in an oral culture is effectively controlled by the priests the people who claim to be you know the people who can actually read the texts which are very rare and therefore not shared with everyone and who claim to have special knowledge well once printing came into being education became easier to spread information became much more available to everybody and what kind of changes do you think that had on society information could not be misinterpreted as easily if they were printed exactly doesn't the written word carry a lot more weight in our society than the spoken word we tend to believe what's written as opposed to what's spoken very often family education so whole families were educated rather than maybe just one or two and what did that eventually lead to it took a long time the gap between the rich and the poor do you think that gap was made smaller or made bigger by education it allowed yeah the raising of children was changed so in effect the gap between the rich and the poor was made smaller by education and education was more available once we had print and books because now many books could be printed and they could be circulated um, and many more people could be educated than previously when one person held all that knowledge that person couldn't share it with as many other people as um, you could with a book and what ultimately today what what are the changes that we would see and maybe attribute to the print medium that didn't exist perhaps in oral culture so education what did education lead to a closing of the gap between the rich and the poor what else did it lead to do you think maybe in terms of uh, politics it propaganda well yeah that's true yeah, it wasn't quite what I was hoping. Industrialization, more options. That rights. Um, that's what I was thinking of. It's lovely when people give the examples I hope you give. <laughs> um, propaganda is correct. No, no, don't be sorry. You're absolutely correct. And we, it, it's relevant. But if we go into that now, we go down a rabbit hole and we won't get to the end of this discussion. Um, what I was trying to elicit if you like is a, an understanding that the printed word ultimately led to greater freedoms for people um, both politically but also socially it meant that knowledge was no longer the preserve of the few or an elite and i'm sure many of you have heard of the phrase knowledge is power so the print medium democratized knowledge and it meant that more people had access to knowledge and therefore power so the ability to earn money uh, and the ability to engage in society in leadership roles than was the case beforehand so that's just an example of how utterly powerful 
a medium can be in changing our society. And that's what Marshall McLuhan meant when he used the phrase, the medium is the message. What he meant is that the medium of print in this example was really what people should have been paying attention to in terms of what was important because that medium as it became more widespread and more ubiquitous changed society in much greater ways than it could ever have been changed by what people might have said or what people might have written in order to be printed. Now clearly there is a slight contradiction in terms there because it's what people wrote that then became printed that helped to influence the change. But what McLuhan is trying to say here is that the, the tool of printing facilitated that in a way that it couldn't have been facilitated in the oral age. And he's going a bit further. He's also saying that it couldn't even have been conceived without print. So it wouldn't even have been possible for us to conceive of the idea of a more educated society and a more equal society if it hadn't been for the development of printing, which not only allowed interesting ideas to be circulated, but actually allowed interesting ideas to arise in our minds in the first instance. So, we think we're on the cusp of another major change in terms of the domination of media. So the original one we suggest is an oral culture. So we're on the cusp of another major change, we think. What, am I, what change is that? So, sorry, we, yes, we, we've moved from oral culture, so the, the oral and aural um, medium, to the print-based medium. What medium is now beginning to dominate? The metaverse. <laughs> Very good, I like that. The metaverse. Any other media that are, is dominating? Gaming, yes. Social media. What are all of those uh, media based on? VR is another one. Digital media. Digital media is the term that I was looking for. Why do you think I was looking for the, the term digital media as opposed to the very good examples you were giving? People's access, yes. What is it that um, defines digital media. So when we use the term digital media, what are we referring to? What is the very basic basis of digital media? Electronic, yes. Keep going. Technology and the internet, yes written. If I were to ask you what is the basis of um, the print media, what is it all based on? What could you, what did you need to have in order to be able to write a book or print something? Paper, yeah. What else? 
definitely needed paper. iPad, we, did, we need that now. Hand, okay, that's, yes, not quite what I was, trees, eyes, a story, all correct. I'm looking for something else. Ink, very good, yeah. Ink and, if you think ink and trees, very basic. Pencil, yes, another very basic too. What do we do with the ink, the trees, and the pencil to communicate ideas? You do need to have something to say, of course. You write. In order to write, what do you need to have? What, what needs to be available to you? Uh, no, what needs to be available to everybody? You do need talent, brain, education, but what, what actual very big language? We're getting close. La you need language, don't you? So you could have a brain, you could be clever and talented, but without a language, you can't write. What, what do you need to have a language? What's the very basic alphabet? Thank you, Magua. Very good. Letters. Letters are the basis of the print medium, aren't they? Letters are what allow us to construct meaning that can then be carried by print. So what are the letters of the digital media? In other words, what, what meaning is carried through letters in print? What is meaning carried through in the digital medium? I give you a hint. There are two of them. <laughs> Only two. F and N. No, not quite. Bits and bytes. Di digital media is effectively based on ones and zeros. Code, exactly. It's one and zero, or zero and one. Perhaps F and N uh, was something in Turkish that referred to that that I didn't understand. I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt. So digital media is based on zeros and ones. So anything that is carried on the medium of ones and zeros, in other words, and one and zero is simply a switch that is turned on or a switch that is turned off. That is the basis of all the digital media we use today. And that's totally different from the basis of print media, which is our alphabet, our letters. What effect do you think that is having on our society and is going to have on our society over the next hundred years, perhaps, or thousand years, assuming human, the human race can survive that long? Maybe before I ask that question, can I ask the other question? We said that oral culture was largely based around the ear. We said print is largely based around the eye. What do you think digital culture is based around? And perhaps before you give an answer to that, what do you think Marshall McLuhan was saying? Did anyone spot that in the interview? Because he did refer to it. Everyone stumped. Well, McLuhan, fingers, <laughs> very good digits. McLuhan actually thought, um, well, let me go back a little. What he said is that um, the electronic media, which he called them at the time. And he was talking in the 1970s. So, you know, it's 50 years ago. He referred to the electronic media and the electrical media. And he was talking about telephones, radios, uh, early television, very early television. So television that you would not recognize today. Television that had one channel, probably came on at uh, five o'clock in the evening, broadcast until maybe 10 or 11 o'clock, and then went away. 
So a very limited kind of television compared with what we're familiar with. He thought that those media were reverting back to the ear and oral culture. Now you remember, I was quite surprised and it, it took me a long time to understand what he meant by that because I thought television clearly is a visual medium. Why would McLuhan be suggesting that television um, was similar to oral culture when clearly we look at television with our eyes? We don't necessarily listen to television. What I think he meant, and I'm not necessarily right, and, and this is why I say that these discussions are important and it's important to take part. I think what he meant was that um, television at that time tended to be enjoyed by families who gathered together. So that's something else that's different um, about television in the 19th, in the 20th century, let's say, from us. We didn't, people didn't have their, their own television screen on a phone. A television was a big, exactly, a family member in your house. It was a big machine, big box. Um, it was put in a big main place in the room. And because it only came on at certain times, people sat down to watch the television together as a family. And I can remember myself when I was very young, people used to talk while they were looking at the television. So depending on the kind of program you were looking at, we all chatted together and we talked about what was going on on the television. We might then talk about something else and that we'd ignore the television for a while. So McLuhan felt that this was very much like the old community, the oral community gathering around a fire and listening to people talking and telling stories. So I, th I think that's where what he meant when he felt that the electronic media were dominated by the ear and were going back to and much more similar to oral cultures. He didn't live long enough um, to really see digital culture become so pervasive. Um, obviously, he was aware of computers and the early development of computers, but no, in no way would he have seen the dominance of digital culture that we have now. So on that basis, what do you think digital culture might come to use as the dominant organ for us as human beings? And let me say, I don't know the answer. I'm not quite sure. But let's, let's have some suggestions. Purchasing power. Okay, perhaps uh, money might be the currency, finance. How do we absorb digital media now? McLuhan thought we would absorb it through the ear. Do you think we do? I think it's a, a combination, isn't it? It's it's audio, it's visuals, it's kind of all of it together. I mean, even touch, I mean, to touch a screen and be able to interact with it that way is, is interesting. Now, that's something interesting. Um, it could be a combination of the eye and the ear, and, and perhaps a greater combination or a more important combination than either oral or print culture had. So the both using both your eye and your ear will perhaps be more important in digital, uh, in the digital medium. But I think maybe more interesting, Frankie, it was you who said that, isn't it? Yeah. I think you mentioned touch. 
we, we yeah. are becoming, aren't we becoming um, much more interactive with digital media through touch, perhaps, than we were with, than we, than through the eye and the ear? What do you think? I mean, I think it's it's interesting. He was talking about kind of. I remember in one of the articles talking about uh, like a hammer. And if a hammer is in your hand, is the hammer part of your hand if you're using it? I mean, that you like I've heard people say, um, more recently, yes. like the phone is practically attached to you, and it's true. You know, like you're holding it, exactly. you're interacting with it through through touch you, all of the time. Yes. You, what he was saying is that you don't have a hand anymore or a hammer anymore that are separate. You now have mm -hmm. a new object, a hammer hand. It's a new word, yeah. and and it's a new object, and it in fact it in it changes both your hand and therefore you as a person, and it changes the hammer. What I want to do now is move on to the idea of tools, and Frankie, thank you for bringing that up with the hammer hand idea. Because Marshall McLuhan had a lot to say about the use of tools as well, didn't he? Um, one of the quotes of his uh, of one of his students, uh, John Culkin, was particularly relevant to that. Can anyone remember what Culkin said? About tools? Nobody can. I, I, I'm going to cheat and I'm going to tell you. So what Culkin said, uh, McLuhan was saying, is that um, we make our tools and thereafter our tools shape us. So think about that for a little while. How does that relate to the discussion we've been having? Or do you think it does at all? Is that something you would have considered before? Is that a new idea to you? All right, you're saying yes, it's a new idea. Okay. Magua says you've changed the hammer and you've changed your hand. It's a new union that neither one before picked up on before that before you picked up the hammer right so okay steve anything can be a tool such as social media which is certainly shaping us very good that is excellent that is actually quite um a sophisticated understanding of tools that people actually don't often have Mostly we tend to think of tools as external physical objects. So we think of the hammer as a tool. But social media is a stronger tool and it is a tool. There is a, the late French philosopher um, and social uh, activist, Bernard Stiegler, proposed the theory around tools which emerged from the original Greek word for tool, which is techne. And he proposed the idea of the pharmacon. And what he suggested um, is that tools, if you understand them in the context of techne, are anything that we use as human beings to interact with our environment. And he went on then to say that in and of themselves, tools could either be a disease or they could be the cure. Hence the pharmacon. So the tools themselves could be at both one and the same time, the disease and the cure. So if we go back to the idea of tools as techne. Just throw out some ideas of tools 
that we as human beings use to interact with our environment that you mightn't have considered tools before. So stretch this as far as your imagination can go. What kind of things can you then describe as tools with that definition? Shoes. Excellent. Message, appli message application. Yeah. Your voice. So your voice is a tool. Would you have thought of that before? It's, that's quite a sophisticated understanding of voice, isn't it? Or it, it's, at least it's a different understanding. But we do use our voice to interact with the environment around us. Emotion. Very good. Emotion is a tool. Body language. Bad goblin. Eyes. Now there's an interesting one. And our eye contact, as uh, Kenny says. I think eyes are part of our body. Um, so whether we would call them tools or not is a moot point. But it's vision is a tool. So eye contact is a, is a tool. But yes, bad goblin, you can tell exactly. So it's by, now that's very good. That's a good analysis. Eyes can actually um, allow you to read somebody's um, emotion. So our body is, and now Sidearm has saying that even our body is a tool. So that definitely makes eyes a tool. And if you see your body as a tool and yeah, isn't it reasonable to suggest that if a tool is an object that we use to interact with our environment and we use our body primarily to interact with our environment, then our body is a tool. Yourself, perhaps. So, But let's not get distracted. We're talking about tools. So ultimately, your body is, in fact, a tool with, with which you interact with the environment. I was very taken with um, the interview with David David Bowie. I presume everybody is aware of David Bowie. He's still relevant to um, our society today, isn't he? And our culture. Okay, well, David Bowie very quickly was um, a musician, contemporary musician, rock musician, pop musician who um, first came to prominence in the 1970s. Um, he died recently, a few years ago. And he's a particularly interesting artist because he developed a lot of the new styles of music. And he took a particular interest in the internet when it started. And he began, he had a very good understanding of the kinds of tools and activities that, uh, particularly cultural tools and cultural activities that were important for our development. You knew his face and you'd probably f be familiar with some of his music because he, he did have a very strong impact on the world. But what people aren't often aware of is just how uh, philosophically literate he was and how he understood um, the concepts of Marshall McLuhan and various other social, uh, social activists, social commentators. And what he said about the internet as a tool was quite interesting. Can you remember some of the Modern love, there's a good one to know. He used a few adjectives to describe the internet. And this was in 1999. So 22 years ago, the internet was new. It had been going, I suppose it had become popular among those who were technically wealthy and literate. 
um, over the decade of the 90s. Many of us still used dial-up modems for using our phone line to connect to the internet, unimaginably slow to people now. He described the internet as unimaginable, um, as exhilarating and exciting. It's quite interesting, isn't it, that he was describing the tool as unimaginable. What do you think he meant by that? And why is that somewhat relevant to our discussion? If we go back to what I was saying about um, the dawn and the beginning of the print uh, medium, I suggested that it would have been impossible for those who were involved in it. Like, for instance, Gutenberg, who is credited with printing the first piece of mass production print. But it would have been impossible for for people to understand and appreciate just how much the print medium was going to change our society in their future. And I think what David Bowie is saying is that it's equally unimaginable for us at the turn of the 21st century to imagine how the internet is going to change our society. If we substitute digital media for internet, I think that's the way I'm thinking. He jokingly said it was an alien life form. So an alien life form, it's a kind of, it is a joke, it's funny and everybody laughed. But there's a serious undertone to that, I think. Because can you imagine if you were sent back to the, the age of oral culture? So if we could time travel, and if somehow you were sent back to um, an oral culture, and you landed in outside a cave, and there were people gathered around a fire, and perhaps they were listening to a storyteller from another area, and most of the people sitting around that fire had never moved more than a couple of miles from where they are. They had been born there, and they said they, they knew they would more than likely die there. Do you think they would recognize you as a fellow human being? With similar experiences? Or what might they think you are? Yes, says Bart. Not the answer I was looking for. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I love about these discussions. Um, I get answers that I wasn't expecting. A weird one. So, okay, now we're going. So they might recognize us as a human being, but a weird one. Alien form. See, I was, I'm, I'm kind of leading the discussion here. I'm being a bit sneaky. I was expecting you to say they might see you as an alien. And if you think about it a bit more, they're dressed in maybe animal hides. Yeah, um, we come to Ziggy in a bit. <laughs> So these people are dressed in animal hides. They've got very crude tools. Um, you arrive in your man-made clothing uh, with your phone in your hand. Um, probably the first thing you would notice is the smell because these people are probably not uh, used to the same kind of cleanliness and hygiene that we are. Um, it's quite conceivable that while they would recognize you as a human type form, they would think that you are a complete alien. Their understanding of alien, of course, wouldn't be like ours. 
they wouldn't think a different planet because they probably don't understand that much about planets um, and life in the rest of the universe. But it is interesting that Bowie chose to use that word to describe the dawn of the digital era. And I think basically what he was saying, and it was said by, if I'm correct, um, Albert Einstein, that any sufficiently advanced technology will seem like magic to those who don't understand it. In other words, digital media is going to change human society in such a way that it will be alien to us now. So why is all of this important? Why is it worth spending an hour talking about Marshall McLuhan and trying to look back at what he said and trying to understand what he meant? Why do you think this is relevant to us today? Or perhaps you think it isn't relevant? Would anybody like to hazard a guess? What Marshall McLuhan said um, was that the reason he talked about the medium being more important than the message was that we should try to understand the impact that this new electronic media was going to have on our society. He suggested that we couldn't tell for certain. We, we don't know. But it was very important that we were aware that it would have a major impact on our society. And that at least by being aware of that, we could be a little bit more attentive to the changes as they occurred. So effectively, what McLuhan was saying is that we need to stay awake. We should not engage with the development of new tools in a sleepy fashion, in a way that doesn't acknowledge that what we're doing is not just affecting us, but is affecting our futures and our societies. As society becomes used to um, particular benefits, it becomes hard for us when we lose them. And I suppose the current pandemic, for instance, has shown all of us that impact. So once we found that we were locked into our homes and we couldn't go out and enjoy the benefits of a relatively free and pleasant society to engage with, we realized that something we had taken for granted was much more important to our everyday lives and indeed our health and our well-being. And in the same way, the development of new tools, if we allow them to become part of our lives and our society, it's such a gradual process that we may not see the impact that they're having and the changes that they are making to our society. And if some of those changes are negative or down the road in a few years, we decide, oh, I didn't think that was going to happen and I'm not so happy with this, it might be too late to stop the impact. 
So what McLuhan was exhorting us to do was to keep awake. He wasn't saying that the tools in themselves were good or bad in the same way that Stiegler referred to the pharmacon. Tools are the disease and the cure. They're the illness and the drug. But we needed to try and stay alert to the impact and the changes that the tools would be having on us and our society as we progress. So if there's any main or key message to take away from this, it's to try and become a little bit more aware of how you interact with the tools that you use and not allow them to control you and to begin to maybe try and affect some control over them so that you are genuinely using these incredibly useful tools that human beings have developed to your benefit and not to your detriment. And that's important as an individual. But as you graduate from college and you go out into your respective societies and you begin to have influence on your society, it's going to be important to that society. Does that make sense to you? I, I always find this a really interesting topic to consider. Um, and as I said at the beginning, I always learn something new from being forced to speak about it and explain what I think McLuhan was getting at, but also from listening to your responses and how you engage with it. Because you're bringing a very different perspective to this uh, than the one I have. And I, I find it really interesting. And to be honest, much more relevant than mine, because you are at the, the leading edge of the changes we're experiencing in society from the, the tools of digital media. So ultimately, this should empower you and make put you in a position of a little bit more control of what happens in the future. Because after all, you are the ones who are going to determine the future of our society.